The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. We are going to be discussing corporate venturing best practices. My name is Kate Humphreys, and I want to make you aware of a couple things before we begin. First, we have other webinars available for you to watch past ones on our YouTube channel. Um, the website is right there. Feel free to um, go and take a look and see if there's um, some more information on what you're looking for. We also have some other ones coming up and we'll be sending out information shortly. So watch your email for those. We will be having a question time at the end. Um, as a reminder, we take all questions through the control panel on your um, GoToWebinar screen. At the bottom of the box, just type in any questions you have. We'll compile them and answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. We are recording today's webinar, and it will be available in the next day or two. Um, you can find the site here. We will also email it to you as a follow-up. Today, our webinar will be discussing corporate venturing best practices. I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. We have David Horowitz, the founder and CEO of Touchdown Ventures, and Vicki Scarborough from NSET2's SDO program. And I'd like to turn it over now to Vicki. Thanks, Kate. Hi, folks. This is Vicki Scarborough. I'm going to give you a little introduction to NSET2 and to our program. Uh, the history of NSET2, it's actually a 14-year-old organization, but um, in 2014-2015 timeframe, uh, Congress asked um, the uh, NSET2 organization to uh, check with its corporate uh, uh, members and, and find out how we could understand how to streamline commercialization faster and make use of the federal funds that are uh, put into universities to do research. So we devised as corporate members at the time, I was in the corporate world, uh, a, a new model, which will be shown shortly, uh, to actually have corporate members vet uh, technology that comes from the universities and create a pool model uh, that uh, allows them to decide whether or not the technology is relevant to them and whether they want to leverage the technology. So we vetted that on a roadshow and uh, through Congress and found that it resonated with a lot of people. We did a demo day in 2016, which was a pilot program, which allowed us to look at uh, some great startups that were vetted through some universities. It was very successful. We did another demo day. Subsequently, we launched something called the IP to Startup Program, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but it basically allows universities to submit their um, intellectual property that's not licensed, but has been filed with uh, either the patent office or other offices, uh, and gives, them, gives our corporate members an opportunity to view uh, intellectual property that might be of value to them. If that intellectual property is of value to them and they feel like a startup could be formed, um, we have a group of startup development officers, uh, which is a program we also just started that allows uh, us to uh, help get that startup formed by providing uh, mentorship and leadership to the technical team of those uh, of that intellectual property. So then that becomes a new startup that the corporate cares about and can provide milestones for. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the IP to startup program in the first box is really um, was devised to help uh, the universities have a place to uh, submit their intellectual property and be viewed and scored by our corporate membership uh, and to be able to create and start uh, uh, new startups out of uh, the intellectual property that looks interesting to the to the corporate membership. From there, the startup development program was uh, initiated and the startup development officers are really folks from the corporate world uh, who may be former executives, angels and VCs, or serial entrepreneurs who have a lot of experience in starting uh, businesses. And um, it really helps create a, a, uh, 
a mentorship for these folks in the technical world who often have very interesting intellectual property but do not have a lot of business um, uh, experience. So partnering up allows us to have a great startup that is then uh, provided um, mentorship and also then milestones from the corporates. We have a university startup demo day coming up and uh, that announcement will be here in a minute, but basically uh, US demo day is basically an event that we sponsor that brings our best startups and allows us to show uh, what is going on um, behind the scenes, what, which we do every day. And that is to vet and look at startups and intellectual property presented to our corporate members. So when you submit your uh, intellectual property or your startup, um, they may be chosen to come to demo day and give presentations. The next slide, please. This is the model that I spoke of earlier that the corporates put together. Basically, you take those up in the upper left-hand side, the federally funded dollars come in and um, they are uh, put to the universities to create uh, startups, to create uh, intellectual property and, and research dollars. That startup that might form out of all of that uh, may be of interest to uh, our corporate members. So in the box in the center are corporate members who then uh, tell uh, once that material is sent to, once those startups and the intellectual property is sent to NSET2 through our global portal, uh, the corporates will grade it and determine whether or not there's an interest. If there is an interest, we also have private funding uh, and uh, angels and VCs available uh, to help uh, provide um, monies that, that then uh, sponsor these new startups. And hopefully with the uh, corporates providing the milestones, that could possibly lead to an exit for those corporates, uh, an, an, either initial public offering or an exit to the corporate that has interest in that. Next slide. The corporate commercialization readiness or commercialization readiness level CRLs are basically a scale upon which you really grade your startups and or your intellectual property. Intellectual property is zero, basically. There's no, no business around it. It's basically just the the raw uh, property that is uh, allows you to form or base forms the base for a new startup. Uh, once a startup is formed and it's based upon intellectual property, uh, the management team has to be put in place and get your licenses and develop milestones and so forth. So the the early stages of commercialization readiness are you know, usually the one to four. Uh, scale and basically that takes you up through probably a validated model or uh, uh, basically a prototype, for example. And this is where uh, funding usually comes from the government, whether it's an SBIR program or so forth. Uh, beyond that, from scale five to 10, this is where you're starting to produce products and you're starting to attract more interest from the angels and VCs who are interested in investing and getting a return on their money based on your revenue and technology that you've developed. So that's where you begin to see uh, more money being put into the programs and more uh, opportunity for exit and, and uh, uh, perhaps acquisition. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, we have our upcoming conference and demo day on uh, Washington, uh, May 1 and 2. Uh, registration is now open and the early bird registration ends um, on March the 9th. If you are interested in attending the conference, uh, please uh, go to this uh, link here and <clears throat> sign up um, and come and be a part of what's going on with the uh, Inset2 world and all of our uh, corporate members, universities, entrepreneurs, and startups. A very, uh, very busy two days of meetings. At the conference, you know, you'll find out about the benefits of the startup development program um, that gives our corporate members um, uh, the benefit and access to the intellectual property and the startups that have been vetted. And you can learn if you're a university how you can actively market your IP and startups to our members as well. So it also helps you in determining, you know, whether or not a provisional patent should move forward and become a full patent. Um, 
you have the opportunity to license your technology and uh, form new startups out of intellectual property that may be of interest to the, to the corporates. Next slide. So we're taking submissions from the universities right now for their startups and their intellectual property. Uh, the current submission deadline is March the 2nd. Uh, we're asking universities to submit their intellectual property. We have a portal online. It's very simple and streamlined portal to uh, fill out. Uh, we try to make that simple so it doesn't take up a lot of time. Uh, then what happens is our corporates will then vet that technology for um, uh, interest. You can visit our website uh, at nset2.org and um, come and, and put your materials on there. That's very simple, very easy to do. And again, our, our uh, demo day is coming up May 1 and 2. So today's webinar is on uh, corporate venturing best practices. And our speaker today is David Horowitz, and he's the founder and CEO of Touchdown Ventures. Now, he has a background in corporate uh, venture funding. Um, he spent a lot of time in the venture fund at Comcast for about 14 years. And uh, he's a graduate of the University of Michigan. His uh, company is based in Philly. And how appropriate that he should name his company Touchdown Ventures when he comes from the town of the world champion Eagles. So with that, I'll introduce David to take us through his corporate uh, venturing best practices webinar. Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, it's very nice to speak to everybody. Wanna to, want to first thank um, everyone at um, the NSA2 organization, Tony, um, Rhea, Kate, you've been very helpful, so appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to, to participate and speak to everybody today. Um, so first, I'm gonna, hopefully everybody um, can see my slides okay. Um, had a little bit of technical difficulty, so we're working off this PDF document. Uh, but before I get into the presentation, let me just uh, provide a little bit more context on my background in our firm, and then we'll talk about uh, the corporate VC best practices presentation. So. Um, as Vicki mentioned, um, I started um, my career in corporate venture actually in the year 2000, which was an interesting time with the um, with the uh, with the dot com bubble bursting. But actually, it was a great time to uh, to, to learn and be in the space. And I started at Comcast, where I was really ended up being one of the early people and, and founders of the venture capital group there. Spent 14 years there and really learned a lot about how you can make an impact. And impact is a word I'll talk a lot about today uh, through corporate venturing. And really a lot of the new businesses and products that Comcast started during the period of time I was there and even continued um, came out of this uh, venture capital group that I was a part of. And you know, during that time, I would get calls from lots of big companies asking for my advice. You know, David, you do this very successfully at Comcast. You know, how, how should we be doing this? I was recruited a number of times to run other uh, corporate venture units. And uh, probably a little bit over, th uh, we started Touchdown about three years ago, so it's probably close to four years ago, the light bulb went off and said, wow, I think I have a great idea. If I could, we love sports analogies, that's why we're called Touchdown Ventures. If I could take the Comcast Ventures playbook using the sports analogy there and apply that to, because it was so successful, and apply that to other corporations who have similar interests and in, in, in need of innovation, um, that could be a very powerful formula. And that's really, um, really what Touchdown does. We work with a number of large corporations, about 10 right now, and really do two things. One, we go through a process of actually um, setting up and launching and establishing a new corporate venture capital fund or program. And on an ongoing basis, we work with the key executives of that corporation to operate it and manage that professionally to yield both financial and strategic uh, benefits. Um, so enough about me. Um, I'm going to walk you guys through this presentation uh, called Corporate VC Best Practices. And it actually, um, these slides were actually taken from a presentation that, um, that we gave at a conference a couple weeks ago. Uh, called Global Corporate Venturing in Monterey. Some of you may have been there and hopefully uh, isn't repetitive for you, but um, it's one of the largest uh, organizations focusing on corporate venturing. And we tend to uh, run a few different workshops and, or, and, um, and different, um, uh, you know, different um, conversations at the conference talking about um, corporate venture. So three things I really want to cover today in this. Um, you know, number one is you know, why corporations are launching corporate venture. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that first. Uh, the second thing, um, is you know how they're structuring them. You know that's obviously important to um, many different ways you can actually structure and build a corporate venture um, uh, program. And the third is just how do you operate it? How do you uh, build it for success and sustainability? So going on to uh, flipping through the slides here, 
Um, we just have, I'll put this up for a second, you know, we're a regulated company, um, we're regulated by the SEC, so we have um, some of the typical uh, legal disclaimers that you'd expect in these types of presentations. Um, and I'll just pause for a second before uh, going to, um, to slide number three. Um, so slide number three, you know, this is something that we feel really, um, um, you know, feel it is really important to emphasize that corporate venture capital is really different than what you might think of venture capital, whether it be angel investors, seed investors, or traditional venture funds. Those folks are really focused on generating uh, financial returns for themselves or the invest and their investors. And corporate venture capital um, also focuses on that, but corporate venture capital is really about innovation. It's about bringing startup companies into the corporation, which really leads to, in some cases, uh, giving the corporation uh, both an advantage and and ultimately, um, you know, hopefully uh, leading to their survival, which is really a good segue um, to the next slide, which is some data that we've been tracking um, from the S&P. And there's a few other organizations, as you can see in the footnote, that have been tracking this as well. And one thing that we're seeing, and I don't know if this is um, something that, um, but we're seeing this with a lot of big companies right now, which is the average lifespan of the S&P 500 is a lot smaller than it was, you know, 50 uh, plus years ago when it, um, you, you know, you should be on the, um, you know, be, th you know, time times have changed. You have obviously a lot of disruptive tech companies that are going after, and 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 startup companies for that matter that are going after, um, and and making impacts in, um, you know, in in incumbent companies. And um, you know, really, um, this is something I think's gotten the attention of you know every major um, CEO or senior leader, and and certainly um, it's probably one of the reasons why all of you who are in corporate innovation roles. Um, you know, exist as well. Um, so this slide um, talks a little bit about, um, you know, you know, if we're going to, if innovation is going to prevent obsolescence, there are many ways of, of doing this. And what we try to do is break down, and there are a lot of different flavors of innovation. And I'm sure if we had a, all the people on this conversation and brainstorm, we could come up with a, another um, 10 or 20 or more classifications, but we try to break this down into five. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide. So I think it's probably relevant to um, how, um, you know, you, even some of you um, operate on, on your day-to-day -day basis. But traditionally, the, the number one way to, um, to innovate was, was what's called, uh, which is R&D, research and development. And we call that inside inside. And what we mean by that is that these are ideas and companies that are generated by the corporation in the inside and are developed in the inside. So that's what the inside inside means. If you go over to the right, you have this concept of incubators. And incubators is, is um, you know, something that, um, is, it's pretty similar to R&D, so it might be an idea or a problem or an opportunity that the corporation um, has invented, but brings outside resources into the company or works with um, outside resources to develop that particular idea. Um, it could also be spinning out a company, so there might be a really interesting um, research project um, or new, um, new product concept that the corporation is working on, and you know, it may make more sense to, to develop that outside the corporation. Um, so accelerators is, is a little bit different. Um, you know, this is where um, you would also think of, you know, open innovation or other programs that are like this. So these might be ideas that are coming from the outside to start up or emerging companies. This it could be from, you know, university, which I know is, um, you know, very, um, you know, area where a lot of people on this call and I know particularly the NSET two team focus on. But the accelerator part is actually bringing them into the inside. So maybe there's a period of time where um, through a program or through um, some mechanism, um, there's a deep level of engagement with the company, but at some point, um, you know, it all, it, it, you know, it, it goes back out in the outside, meaning it's a separate company from the corporation. So venture capital, um, you know, this is something that actually, if you believe it or not, is growing, and we'll show that on the next slide, and next two slides, but actually, I think among these is actually one of the, one of the areas that's probably least used by corporations. Um, I think we were just looking at some research yesterday that shows, you know, really only you know, 10 or 20 percent of Fortune 1,000 companies, um, you know, have very active um, venture capital programs. But really, what this is is really outside to outside. So these are companies that are obviously starting up from the outside, whether it be from a university or whether it be, you know, in another, um, just an entrepreneur coming up with a great idea and forming their own company. But the funding still occurs on the outside, so the corporation becomes a minority investor in the company. Now there might be some commercial relationship where it brings it on the inside, but it's still a very much an arm's length, um, you know, an arm's length process. And then obviously M and A um, would be taking an outside company and bringing it in by buying, you know, buying control, which is always a great thing to do. Uh, but we all know has a lot of risk, and 
um, a lot of what we're seeing now is, is, is some of these other programs, particularly venture capital, uh, being a great way to de-risk M&A by first starting out um, maybe having a commercial partnership with a company or a minority investment in the company. And th those um, activities go really well. And we um, you know, think that um, you know, this would be a good company to acquire control of um, creating, whether it's a, a formal option or informal option to own that company is, is I think one of the reasons why um, you know, some of these programs are, are, are being successful or good feeders to, to, to the M&A process. Uh, but we really think, you know, we feel very strongly, obviously, I've been in this industry for a long time, so you, you can imagine there's some bias here, but venture capital does provide a lot of, um, a lot of leverage. So the amount of capital you have to invest is much smaller. Um, the amount of time is, is typically smaller. And, and just generally, um, you know, I think the best venture capitalists are really good at going deep and going and finding, you know, all of the companies that are out there and I'll show you another slide in, 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 a, in a little bit about the, um, you know, the intelligence um, and, and other informational benefits of that beyond, you know, the investment piece. Um, and that's actually a good segue. That's, that's this, um, you know, this slide here, which is talks about, um, you know, talks about intelligence. I didn't know if it was coming up right away. Um, but what this looks like is a funnel. So think, you know, when, when we think of corporate venture capitalists, including myself and others, you think about, you know, we're, we're evaluating a funnel, we're finding companies and trying to, you know, push them down the funnel ultimately to um, either investments or partnerships or acquisitions or some commercial relationship. Um, but, but what happens is, you know, we might look at, you know, on average, um, let's just say 500 companies a year, which would be pretty typical for a corporate venture fund. And, you know, we might only invest in 1% in, in of them, which would be five companies. But the other 495 companies really can provide some really interesting you know, intelligence about the market can give us good insight and in maybe the overall corporate strategy. Um, maybe it's a company that we, you know, maybe because it's too early stage, you know, we don't do a commercial relationship with in, you know, 2018, but we're tracking and developing a relationship with that entrepreneur for the future. And so that, that all, um, you know, we feel is the role of the, of the corporate venture capital organization. And so not surprisingly, you know, this is one of the fastest growing areas of venture capital, as you could see, um, you know, the amount of dollars that um, corporate venture investing is at an all-time high, number of deals is, 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 is pretty close to that. Um, I think what's really interesting in 2017, and most of this data comes from an organization called PitchBook, um, you know, 44% of all capital includes a corporation. So it's almost half, which is pretty remarkable. Um, that's, you know, you know probably um, double, if not triple, from what the numbers were like, you know, you know 10 years ago. So this is a very fast-growing industry. I think part of it is, is some of the context that I gave you, which is companies saying, we need to be out there, we need to be meeting with every startup, and you know, we need to have the ability to um, you know, invest and partner with them. And, and you know, this concept of you know, first becoming a minority investor is, is obviously gaining a lot of um, traction in the marketplace. Another thing that, that we did, which I think helps to, to why corporations are doing this, um, you know, and we did a whole report, we did the same thing in 2016, but we, uh, refresh the report based on the, the data from last year, which is we looked at the top 100 corporate venture capital investors from this organization, uh, Global Corporate Venturing, and we saw, I, I think about half of them were publicly traded, some of them are private, uh, a lot of them are private companies. And we basically looked and said, okay, how does their stock price performance compare to the index that they're trading on? If they trade on NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange or a foreign exchange, and this is the data that we found. And we, we were pretty amazed on it, and the data that we saw from 2006, this is the 2017 data, the 2016 data was pretty similar. That a, a you know, company that has a corporate venture fund outperforms the index that they're trading on. And it shouldn't be too surprising, you know, these are companies that are generally more innovative, they're trying and, and looking at ways to reinvent themselves, they've gone through digital transformation. And so we, we like to show this data because we obviously feel um, it makes a great case for, um, you know, for, for why, you know, um, sometimes when you're presenting to the CEO, um, the CEO and the board really care about the stock price. And a lot of times you say, well, core venture, that's not going to happen for five years. You know, that's, you know, I'm looking at short term results. And so we feel we found, a, you know, a set of data that shows, no, this actually does generate, you know, results and, and ones that, you know, the board and the senior leadership cares about, which is the stock price. So hopefully I've convinced you, um, you know, made the case of, of why you're seeing corporations do this. Um, now let's talk about, you know, sort of how to build it and how to structure it. And the first thing that we really believe at Touchdown is really defining objective and quantifiable goals, because that really should 
um, you know, help determine how you structure and even how you operate the, the entity. And what we really mean by here is what those strategic goals are. Is it commercial relationships? Is it market intelligence? Is it, um, you know, is it a talent acquisition play? Um, is it a pipeline for M&A? So you really want to understand, and that's actually when we're working with a corporation, the first thing we'll do but when we start a new uh, engagement is really to um, really understand and define and even put some um, you know, objective, uh, measurable objectives against those goals. And based on those goals, especially if those goals are strategic, we have to think about the entity. And so this slide shows really four different ways you can do corporate venture. Um, you know, the, the x-axis shows the level of commitment, the y-axis shows um, you know, the, um, the, the approach between a more active approach and a passive approach. We generally like the top right-hand corner. This is the corporation starting their own CVC, either with their own team or partnering with a firm like Touchdown or another company that does this, um, and making that real high commitment, putting capital to work that we're ready to invest in companies. We feel that generates, you know, the best results. But there are other options. You know, the one on the left would probably be my second favorite, which is, you know, we're going to start our own VC. Maybe we don't have the amount of capital to you know, create a dedicated fund, so we're gonna look at investments you know, on a one-off basis. I still think that could generate um, great returns. The bottom you know, would be better than doing nothing, but wouldn't be as good as the top. And the bottom would be, let's go approach other venture capital funds that may already be out there, and let's go invest in them. We can learn from them. Maybe we'll get some deal flow. Um, I think the challenge with that, obviously, is if, if strategic is the most important thing, it's hard to get strategic results unless you're doing this you know, on your own, it's your own um, organization. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think um, you know, sitting on the sidelines would be the worst thing to do. And so, you know, at least operating in one of these quadrants, whether it's a lower commitment or a more passive approach. Um, but I like the top right-hand corner, and and obviously that that um, is is what what we typically recommend. So here's some structural considerations. Uh, just in the interest of time, I won't won't go through the whole um, bullet points. But you know, number one is obviously defining the strategic value. Um, number two is you know control um, control over. The investment decisions control over you know the investment process we think that's really important for a corporation um, number three is reputation you'd be surprised that this is something that most corporations don't really focus on but it really is a key to you know generating deal flow to being able to get deals done with entrepreneurs and with other uh, venture investors um, managing risk you know this is really important um, obviously this is a, a legal impact but also a financial impact around diversification of a portfolio not dissimilar to you know any other types of you know financial investing um, and then obviously expense, which is, you know, um, you know, this is not, you know, obviously expense in terms of capital, but expense in terms of operating expenses to run something like this. And and obviously, um, you know, the, the the hardest thing is going to be, you know, who's operating this, the you know, legal, financial, and accounting, and other considerations. And and obviously, you need to to understand that before you uh, figure out the right structure. So now, um, you know, the last thing I wanted to cover in this presentation is is just some tips on on operating the corporate venture after we, you know, figured out why we're doing this and and how to structure this. And so, um, you know, at Touchdown, we feel really, um, really strongly that you know before you actually start executing the venture fund, which would be you know generating deal flow and doing due diligence and, and doing investments, you got to set it up appropriately. And it starts with the goals that I mentioned, but it really is more than that. It's about you know, aligning the investment strategy with the business units, thinking about the sectors and themes that you want to focus on, because focus can be really important. Um, the infrastructure components I mentioned before around, you know, understand having an accounting policy, um, you know, being able, being prepared to, um, you know, to be able to have the right diligence process in place. So that that's something that we, you know, most, a lot of corporate VCs actually don't go through this process. We think the ones that do are, are going to be set up more for success. The last piece of this would be, you know, even the marketing positioning, you know, how do you want to um, tell your story to startups and to other VCs and the rest of the ecosystem? And, you know, that's something that is as important as anything, because if you don't have a great messaging, um, you know, of, of what you stand for and what you're focusing on, um, it may be hard to achieve the goals of the corporate VC. Um, so once that sort of setup and strategy um, work is done, you know, we feel like you can graduate to, you know, starting to, you um, you know, to run, which is, you know, going out and looking at, at deal flow and starting to do due diligence and, and making and managing investments, um, which, which is, you know, you know, what you think of when you think of, you know, a venture capital investor. So the last thing, and, and I, I'm, I'm going through this um, at a good pace to leave time for, for questions, because I know, I'm sure this presentation and this topic in general 
um, solicits a lot of questions. But I really just wanted to close this with just some you know guiding lights and principles and three things that that we think about. Um, this is a little bit repetitive of what we covered, but you know the first thing is um, you know um, really defining that strategic value. I think it's best doing that through a dedicated effort that the corporation controls. Um, the second thing is um, you know first before you start looking at investments, have a strategy, have a goals. You know think of this as the report card that the um, senior executives in the corporation are going to look at and say, well, how do I know whether this corporate venturing group is successful or not? And you could go and say, well, here are our goals. You know, we said we were going to do X, Y, and Z, and we've achieved them. And you have um, a way to communicate that, you know, internally the organization. I think that's critical. And the last part is reputation. I think this is where, um, you know, um, a lot of corporate venture investors um, get get hung up, which is, um, you know, not thinking about their reputation, not preserving that. Um, you know, we think that the, the best th the best way to do that is to hire people, um, you know, that are very experienced. Um, that have, um, you know, been doing this for a while that, um, you know, that can, you know, you know, um, clear all the landmines that exist in this space. And, and that's probably a good segue for the last, that, you know, this is the riskiest form of investing. Um, and so be disciplined and, and you know, make sure, um, you know, you're not rushing into anything and, and everything's very, very thoughtful. So um, that that's really all I wanted to cover in terms of my presentation. So um, I'm sure I look forward to um, sort of, I'm sure receiving a lot of great questions and, and certainly happy to follow up with anybody um, who's interested in talking more on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But I'll turn it back to um, Vicki to um, to lead the, the Q&A portion of this presentation. Oh, thanks, David. Uh, great presentation. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I know they're coming in uh, fast and furious, so we'll get them up on the screen here in one second. Great. So, um, Let's see where we at. Give us a minute to get these up. Just as a reminder, if you would like to submit questions, please feel free to drop them in the control panel under questions, and we will uh, put them into the presentation to get them answered for you. We are recording this uh, webinar and it will be available the next day or two. You can see the links here, so jot those down if you'd like to uh, rewatch or share it. All right, Vicki, questions are for you. Okay, so David, at what commercialization stage are you interested in technology startups? Great question. Um, you know, for us in general, um, you know, we we tend to be um, tend to be interested is you know in pretty early stage companies. You like to meet the companies early. Um, I, I would say, you know, there there probably are a series of companies where it may just be too early, where they're still in product development, um, still thinking about product market fit. You know, maybe you're still um, you know trying to get that sort of beta or anchor um, you know customer. So. I would say we're always open to meeting companies, especially if we feel it's in a you know, thematic theme that we're focusing on. In terms of when we would invest, we, we'd wait till there was um, you know, product market fit and, and we feel like we could validate um, you know, the commercialization of, appeal of, of, of that particular startup. All right, the next question please, Kate. How does Touchdown work with university startups or intellectual property? Great question. Uh, yeah, Touchdown is probably similar to any other corporate venture group or maybe even venture group from this regard. Um, you know, obviously, if if the startup is is in one of our thematic focus areas, like I said, we want to know about them. I, I think it's a big challenge for you know a, a group like us. I mean, we have a fairly big team; we're almost 20 people, but still, um, being able to cover every university um, is pretty challenging. So we rely on you know partners, you know, groups like and set two, I think, do a phenomenal job of, of helping and providing filtering and, um, you know, other aspects. But, um, you know, there's obviously a couple of universities, you know, ones that we're, we're local to that are easy to recover. But um, I, I think that's a challenge for any any in BC. So we really do appreciate, you know, organizations that help us um, with that filtering process. I think when we would engage with them on an investment, like I said, from the earlier conversation, um, you know, when, when, when there's a little bit more 
uh, commercial validation. Yeah, right, understood. All right, next question. How do corporate venture groups work with angels? Great question. Um, I would say generally, um, we've we've actually co-invested with angel groups before. I mean, typically, um, you know, there are um, different groups that I'm sure you guys are aware of that sort of band together to to, to make investments. Um, and so we've actually co-invested with some of those groups before. We're very open to that. We think they can bring a lot of value. Um, sometimes we're meeting with them and exchanging deal flows. So I would say the groups we treat t tend to treat a lot like other you know, seed and early stage venture investors. I think the individual angels, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of them. I think some of the universities, it's hard to, to keep track of everybody, but keep track of everybody. There, there might be a few that are more active in our you know, sectors and spaces that we you know, may develop better relationships. But I would say we're overly positive about, you know, either co-investing or following on investments that those groups do. All right. Um, can you comment on how what you presented might be different for the pharma biotech industry? Great question. Um, you know, I, I personally haven't um, had as much experience in the industry, but obviously have um, met and, and um, gotten to know other corporate venture capitalists in that industry. Um, I, you know, I think uh, obviously a lot of those uh, in, you know, companies will uh, invest a lot earlier, certainly pre-revenue, pre, um, you know, pre-regulatory approval on, on, on you know, specific products. And, um, you know, that might be different than, than how, um, you know, how we might invest in other industries. Um, so I think the level of risk and appetite is higher. There may also be more um, specific controls around, you know, options to acquire companies and, and things like that or even tighter commercial relationships. But my sense is a lot of it might be tied to, you know, things like regulatory approval, um, which, you know, you know, may, may be less of an issue in other industries that, you know, that, 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 that we operate in. Right, right. How do startups best get the attention of a corporate venture capital group? Great question. Um, I, I think, I don't think it's different than any other venture group with with a couple of exceptions. So I, I think to get on the radar screen of any venture group, you know, a warm referral or introduction is really important. So, um, the pe you know, there's just so many inbound deals that we get and it's hard for us um, quite candidly to take, um, to be able to process that. So we like, you know, referrals from, you know, other, other people in our network, other VCs, other industry experts. Um, you know, occasionally if the, if the startup's already working on a gets this relationship with the corporate, you know, knowing that there's already that validation can be particularly helpful, but that'll probably be less applicable for earlier stages. So I think figuring out, you know, how to get a warm lead to that, you know, corporate venture investor would be my best advice. All right. As a university researcher, how can I identify a corporate venture group that does not have not invented here culture some corporate researchers are quite reluctant to new ideas from the outside. I think it's a great question. Um, I, I think, I mean, if any corporate venture group is, is not invented here, then they're not doing it right because their whole purpose, you know, as we talked about in the outside outside is to look at outside ideas and evaluate them for the company. So well, I, I don't think every company is set up the right way. I think the the ones that are set up where they have, whether it's in, you know, open innovation program or corporate venture program or wh whatever that they call it, um, those are the ones that you want to be talking to and, and the ones that are really just focused on their own internal ideas and internal R&D. I mean, they're just, you know, it's probably going to be a waste of time to engage with them. So I think you have to, you know, do your research, figure out uh, which organizations, um, you know, have made investments before, have partnered with startups and, um, you know, you never want to be the guinea pig or the first one. That, that's the best advice I can give you. Great. So we'll probably take one more question here. Great. So it looks like this question is about um, virtual versus physical startups. I, I, I want to interpret the fact that virtual means that the company, um, you know, the, the people working at the company are not all in one location, whereas I, I think physical startup would be all the employees in one location. I, I hope that's what 
the person who asked the question is referring to. Um, I, you know, I, 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 assuming that's the question, um, I, I think I have a bias toward um, people working in the same office. I, 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 every VC might have a different answer to that. I, I just, from my experience, that tends to yield better results. We demand that as well with the teams that we hire of our people in our firm. Um, I, I, you know, I think there are some exceptions to that. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of companies that might have, for example, their R&D or technology, you know, in a center of excellence like in Israel, uh, but it might make more sense for the business and sales and marketing and, and other organizations being in another location. So I think the two offices could work where you have the separation of responsibilities, but, you know, having, you know, many different developers or engineers or, you know, business people in all different locations. I, I just I'm I'm skeptical that that you know there obviously are are examples of companies that will succeed, but I, overall I would I would I think the risk is higher and and you know I think any VC you know this is already a risky business like we talked about um, you know we want to invest in you know companies where we think the the risk is as you know risk is always high but we want to mitigate risk as much as possible. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, David, for the wonderful uh, uh, webinar today. I think there was uh, great information for those interested in uh, corporate venture capital. Um, we've got, again, a reminder to everyone that our conference and demo day is coming up May 1 and 2. Registration is now open, so get online and get yourself signed up to come to our conference. Uh, be a part of this uh, great experience. Our deadline for submissions for intellectual property and university startups um, is uh, this Friday, March 2nd. Uh, this will get you in the queue for uh, having our corporate members uh, vet your startup or your university intellectual property. Uh, you can uh, add that into your um, uh, things to do for the week. So thank you so much for joining us today on Corporate Venturing Best Practices. Thanks once again to David Horowitz for his uh, expert advice on corporate uh, venture capital uh, needs. And thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. We hope to, uh, that you join us again and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.